Hello everyone and welcome to the Geek Nighter YouTube channel. I am Kaival Yapte and I am starting this new series on database internals where I'm going to talk about different concepts and patterns that are used within several databases. And these patterns are also implemented in some way or the other in different flavors in distributed systems. Before you watch this video, I want to talk to you about a conference. There's so much going on in the data and machine learning space, it's hard to keep up. Did you know that graph technology lets you connect the dots across your data and ground your LLM in actual knowledge? To learn about this new approach, don't miss nodes on October 26th. At this free online conference, developers and data scientists from around the world share how they use graph technology for everything from building intelligent apps and APIs to enhancing machine learning and improving data visualizations. There are 90 inspiring talks over 24 hours, so no matter where you are, you can attend live sessions. To register for this free conference, visit neo4j.com slash nodes. That's neo4j.com slash n-o-d-e-s. Thank you. Now enjoy the video. So in today's video, I'm going to start the series with talking about right ahead logging as a pattern and how databases use this pattern to ensure data integrity and also durability. So let's get started. First of all, I want to talk to you about, at a high level, how databases store data. As you see here, there is a disk and it's a permanent storage and data files and indexes exist here. And whenever you insert new data, data files are the way databases store your data. For example, here you see one data file has multiple pages and or blocks. In some databases, these are synonymous to each other. Some databases make some differences, but let's say your data in a file is stored in terms of blocks and pages and something like this. And as you can see, one data file can have multiple blocks and block is basically a fixed unit of storage, which is the uh, minimum data that you read from a database or write to a database. So you write or you deal with the data on disk in terms of blocks and this can be 4KB, 8KB, dif different size blocks uh, depending on the database. But that's not important. These are implementation detail. So what I want to emphasize on is that data is stored on permanent storage like disks where they have data files. Each data file has blocks and each block stores your data. Now, depending on the, the entry or the, the size of the row, your one block can have multiple rows. So for example, you have a books table where you have ID, title, author, and price. So as you can see, one block contains multiple rows. In this case, let's say three rows. And there's another block, which contains the next three rows. And this is the fixed unit of storage, right? The blocks. As we mentioned, from the disk, whenever you are reading or writing rows, you cannot just read one row because that's too, too inefficient unless the block size is equal to the row size. But that's typically not the case because your rows are typically smaller. But from the disk, when you read, you read blocks. And when you write, you write blocks. This is the smallest unit. Just explaining this to make sure I laid the foundation where we talk about the problems that we face when we, let's say, want to update the state of the data or when transactions are performed on a database. So with this, as we discussed, there's a books table and the clients want to update the database, update books, update the state of the books or data or multiple records in a database. And they write SQL queries, they open transactions, and then they commit. So what happens? How do we update the result of the transaction? So let's say the transaction updates 10 books, updates author names for them. And how do we make sure that these author names are updated and stored on the permanent disk? Or rather to say, these changes are durable, right? So of course, we can just update the in-memory and take the in-memory data to the disk later in an asynchronous manner. But as you can imagine, this is not durable because servers can crash. So once you update the transaction or the state of the book in memory, the server crashes and then you don't have anything on the permanent storage. So when the server has to boot up again, there's no way it can figure out what was the last state, which means it's a risk on data durability and also data integrity depending on the complexity of the transaction. But to solve that problem, you can of course write it on disk, right? So as in when you're committing the transaction, you can update the data file for that particular row and get done with it. But there is a problem because if you keep updating data file for each transaction commit, there's a lot of IO. We'll look at 
why it is a problem in further detail. But for now, let's assume it is too much I.O. because for each transaction, you're updating multiple pages. And the problem is, do we really want to do this? Is there a better way? Do we want to perform a write on each transaction commit? Do we have a choice? Really? So the baseline is that we want to ensure that transactions are committed. The, the state of the database is consistent, is integral, and also the changes are durable. And we also want to make sure that this operation is efficient because otherwise the databases are not going to perform well. So here comes the write ahead logging as a pattern and how databases use this pattern to efficiently ensure that data integrity and durability is maintained. So what do we do is, Instead of writing or updating the data files directly for each transaction commit, we just log the transaction. And basically the log is the, the source of truth. So whenever there is a transaction we want to commit, we update the log. Log contains what exactly happens. What was the transaction about? So it can contain the data like the transaction ID, like who is updating the transaction, when the transaction happened, the timestamp, and anything that helps you identify what this transaction is doing and recover the state. So a log is the sequential append only data structure that you maintain. So whatever transaction happens, you make an entry in the log, you update the in-memory data structure, and then that's it. But why is it enough? Because if let's say you update the in-memory data structure, you log the entry without updating the data on the file, which I'm talking about the data files on permanent storage. If the server crashes, you have the log, right? And then by replaying the logs, you can easily maintain the last consistent state and maintain the data integrity. So basically what you're doing is without actually updating the data files on permanent storage, which is expensive, which is not very efficient, you are ensuring that you have a way to bring the consistent state back if there is a crash or some other kind of failure. So basically you're logging what has happened. It's like a history of transaction, what each transaction is doing. And on reading this log, if you are able to replay, you will get the consistent state. That's the entire idea. So basically, whenever a client creates a transaction, you just update the in-memory status or in-memory state of the record, and then you maintain a log. This is basically the synchronous operation. And then you commit then and say that, okay, this is done. And then asynchronously, that will be updated and the data files will be updated, which can lead to multiple data files to be updated depending on the complexity of the transaction. One point I want to make here, as you can see, this log is always ahead of the data files. So data files will always have stale data because you're not updating it synchronously. And these are taken care by a background process, which leads the, uh, reads the log and updates the data file. So in a way, this log is always ahead of the data file. And that hence the right ahead logging, it's very clear name. Rarely you'll find clear names in software engineering. We should definitely give kudos to whoever has named this pattern. And then asynchronously you update the data file as you can see here and also the index, right? But is it only about the efficiency? So we see that wall provides you a way to do efficient writes just to log an entry and then do the inefficient write, which is random IO on the data files later in time, which is, which is efficient or at least not consuming the resources at the transaction commit. But it also provides you a way to do point in time recovery which means that you basically have a log of events of what has happened to the database, which means you can go to any point in time, see what was the status or how many transactions should have been done, and then recover that state, which means if there is a problem in, let's say you in introduce a bug in your application, which ends up updating the data in an incorrect manner, and now you want to go back to that correct stage before the bug was deployed to production. Without this log, you have no way because you just have the current state and there's no history, right? Maintaining this history gives you an ability to do point in time recovery, which is great because developers make mistakes. We introduce bugs and ability to recover to a previous consistent state is a great feature. So yes, wall are also used for point in time recovery, also used to back up the state of a database to different replicas while ensuring data integrity and data durability in a very efficient manner. But what leads to the efficiency? Let's go a little bit deeper into how the data file update, if we do it on each transaction commit, might be expensive and is inefficient. So 
basically log is a simple data structure, right? It's a sequential up and only log. And then this log can contain data or transaction information related to different transactions. And then with one F sync, which is the system call to sync the, the buffer data with the disk directly. So with one F sync, you are able to commit or make the changes durable for multiple transactions, which is a great win because sequential uh, is, is IO is definitely better than random IO on disk. And it's way more efficient. As you can see, depending on the complexity of a transaction, you can have multiple data pages to be updated as part of one transaction. So as you can see, there's a lot of random IO happening here on the disk, which is inefficient because in at least in traditional hard disk drives, it has to do a mechanical movement. And depending on the RPM settings or RPM ability of the disk, it can be really slow. There's a hard limit on how many times the particular sector of a disk will come under the, the spinning head. And it's really slow because it has to move, make a mechanical movement and whatnot. So it is expensive if you have to read random pages and update randomly the disk. It has gotten better with SSDs, which is solid straight, straight drives and which does not have any mechanical movement and you can do better with random IO as well. But still, it's not the most efficient way and sequential IO is still better even in SSDs. So yes, that's where the, the efficiency is coming from because it's, sequ uh, it's sequential. You're just uh, appending to a log and then this log can be uh, synced with the disk very efficiently. And that's the benefit, right? Because you're not updating the data file for each transaction commit, but you're just maintaining a log. Now, more importantly, so this was about ride ahead logging as a pattern, how it is implemented by various databases. And no matter what kind of database you're using, there's some form or the other where transaction logs are maintained. And these transaction logs are also used for something like a CDC, where you want to capture each and every data and change data capture basically, and uh, take that data and take that log of commit or the transactions to somewhere else and replicate it, right? So it, it opens up a new world. I want to talk a little bit more about this pattern, how it can be also replicated in a different setup, which is a distributed system setup. So imagine you have an application like this, which on receiving certain request, it has to talk to several services. As you can see in this case, there are three services and it has to update them. It has to notify a service and whatnot. And this is a similar thing, right? So if you create an analogy with what it was doing with the database, it's randomly updating different services. In databases, it was randomly doing different things on data files on disk. Again, here it's network because you have to make different network calls and doing it synchronously or when I say synchronously, the client is waiting. That's what I mean. And it might be inefficient. And if there is a way for you to just log the, the entry and then do it asynchronously, this is a great pattern because you don't have to block the client and the changes can happen or the systems, the different services can be updated asynchronously which is where right ahead logging as a pattern can be used. But how do we create a log, right? In terms of the database, it was like a simple file or data structure that is flushed to a file. But how do we do it in distributed systems? Well, there's a distributed commit log, which is Kafka, and there are several other alternatives, but I'm using Kafka as an example here, and which is basically a distributed log, right? So how does the architecture change? It changes like this. So now your application basically is maintaining a log, which is pushing an event to Kafka, a specific topic. And then there are workers that can read from Kafka and update specific service. So this is a this is a great pattern. It's like an expansion of right ahead logging pattern because Kafka will always be ahead of the different services that you want to update. This is all about right ahead logging and it's a great pattern. It's really widely used and it's important for anyone who wants to understand database internals and who wants to update or understand the, this pattern and apply it somewhere else where wherever there is complex updates or network calls happening and you want to just log it. By the way, this is not perfect because there's always trade-offs. So you have to maintain the infrastructure. So let's say you don't have Kafka. So now what to do? Because then probably the synchronous calls was better. But let's say there was an option. You already have a Kafka topic. And then the other problem is, so if you already have a Kafka topic, it's definitely easier. And the other problem is you have to maintain the workers, right? It comes with a, an added maintenance uh, effort but it might be suitable for many use cases. So this is a pattern that is definitely not perfect. At least in the database world, it's definitely a more efficient and an easier way to for databases to ensure data integrity and durability. So I hope you like this video. I hope you like this pattern. And if you like this episode, please hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do that. And it keeps uh, me motivated 
and yeah so stay curious and keep learning see you in the next video thank you